everybody. Welcome. Uh, today's conversation is with Steve Zaffron, who is the co-author of The Three Laws of Performance, which he wrote with Dave Logan, who also wrote one of my favorite books, Tribal Leadership. And um, he's the CEO of the Vanto Group, which is a formidable consulting group that implements large-scale change initiatives and transforms people's performance um, profoundly, and they work on every continent. Um, so today, uh, my intention is that in this conversation, uh, that together uh, it really has the power to, to open up and shift your relationship to the future. Steve and I met, we were just saying, in 1974, so... You were just a, ch a I was, tiny child. I was, I was very young. <laughs> we both were. Um, but we met, uh, yeah, in 74, when I was in charge of enrollment for uh, AST, which has um, now become the landmark uh, education. And we both worked for Werner Erhardt, who was one of the most important philosophical thinkers of the 20th century. Um, and whose work has touched tens of millions of people around the world and, and impacted ideas and, and ideas and things that, that most people don't even know that it actually came from the work that, that he did and that we did um, in, the, in the beginning, especially. Uh, so what I'd like to do is introduce that, that today the topic um, has to do with how do you access the future? You know, how do you, where do you stand in a way that can really transform the possibility of leadership, of life, of the kind of results that you can um, have personally and also on a global scale. You know, Steve, I have, I have a lot of respect for, you know, works with organizations that have 30,000 employees and it's, it's like moving a, a city, basically. Uh, you know, I live in a small city, so I, I really want to, you know, I'm excited to give everyone who's listening to this now and who'll be listening later uh, an opportunity to really have the, the power of what he has to say. So thank you and welcome, Steve. Well, thank you very much, Patricia. It's great to be in this conversation with you. It ties together a lot of loops over the years, doesn't it? It does. It really does. So the first thing is I want to, um, I'd love to have you speak about uh, something that that I know is is. Is lives in the work that you do, which is what is the difference between talking about something and get, giving getting access to it? Okay, <clears throat> we used an analogy. Here's an analogy that we like to use. Okay, so if you go to where a game is being played, whether it's a baseball game or even a, a dance is is being shown, like a, a theater or play or a tennis match. What you do is you walk into the place where it is, the stadium or the theater, right? So it's got a boundaries. And then you look around, and what do you see? Basically, you see people. But everybody's not in the same position. So there are some people who are sitting in the stands. They're watching the performance. Then there are people on the field. They're doing the performance. So the conversations people have in the stands, you could call that the observer conversation or the... Uh, talking about the game conversation mm -hmm. is very different than the conversation happening on the field. On the field, there's not a lot of talking, but there's some talking because that's part of the game. So when the quarterback says hike, he intends or she intends for the ball to be moved. Right. And a dancer moves in a certain way. That, in that intention is for another dancer to move in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So visual cues and communications that are going on all the time. Uh, access, though, is really in the domain of the trainer, the coach, the person who's on the field, whose job it is, is to have the team win. Right. So that, that person's not in the stands. You know, they don't have idle conversations. Mm -hmm. Having conversations that are intended to have the performers access something. You could say access something within themselves. That's some way people talk. Mm -hmm. Or access a new way of seeing the moment. Or access a new understanding of what they need to do and get the motivation to do it because the intention is a breakthrough in performance or something to happen. So access is getting my hands on the levers and dials of whatever is making something work, grabbing it, and then making it work. Yeah. And that's a big, I mean, that distinction alone uh, is worth the conversation because a lot of, a lot, you know, at this point, there's so much information and videos and you know, people talking about a million things. And 
to have the distinction of like what kind of conversations actually give you greater access to what they're talking about instead yeah. of that you just understand it or you you're, think it's interesting or you have an opinion about it or you know something in that realm so and I know you know that you're you're you probably don't even know how to speak um, in the stands <laughs> about anything at this point you know I mean you're trained you know your way of being and and the way that you work is to give people access well I'll, I'll have conversations in the stand when I don't have anything at stake yes. and I want to just kind of like spend my time chatting yes. but I don't put that down yeah there's um there is mm-hmm. another conversation that's of that ilk, but it's got an intention. It's a conversation to understand something. Mm-hmm. So as I, I, I was in academics for a while, um, studied philosophy, and a lot of that, that kind of work was to understand the nature of this or the nature of that. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, though, produce in performance. So if your intention is not so much to convey understanding, which sometimes is necessary. Right. Because the doctor has to understand certain things before he or she can do the operation mm-hmm. or the diagnosis correctly. Correct. What it takes to diagnose somebody, to look at a situation a person is dealing with and say, okay, this is what it is, mm-hmm. is not understanding. That's something else. What it takes for a manager to look at the last couple of minutes of a baseball game or a football game uh, uh, or or confront, you know, in a wartime situation, the last few moments of a fight so that you win and not lose. Mm-hmm. It takes to see all that and to do something that makes the difference is what we're talking about here. Yeah, totally. So how do human beings do that? Our answer is, it's all in language. Everything is in language. So while you and I don't tend to think of ourselves as creatures of language, uh, that's how we see people. And human beings are human beings because of their ability to speak and listen. Mm-hmm. Certain kind of conversations have a great impact. The kinds we're talking about. Right. There are conversations, for example, of commitment. So if I commit, and I commit under certain conditions, my commitment rules my actions for the next period of my life, perhaps for the rest of my life. Right. If I get married, and many people get married, mm-hmm. people get married in a way in which the marriage doesn't last, and some people perhaps get married in a way it does. Mm-hmm. The difference may be the way those vows exist for the people being married through time. Right. Um, so our access is language, and we call the kinds of language that produces performance access distinctions. So start, let me, let me take you just slightly back to go forward is, you know, the name of your book is The Three Laws of Performance. So <laughs> performance isn't necessarily something ha- people have the same understanding of. So what do you mean by performance first? And then what are the three laws of performance? Right. So performance in a very simple way, and I always like to look at things as simply as I can, mm-hmm. is uh, how something turns out that human beings are engaged in. So okay. I'm going to play this game with you. If we're playing the game to win or lose, winning is a performance outcome, losing is a performance outcome. It doesn't always have to be win or lose. It could be we end up having had a great time together. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't think of that as performance, but if you and I were going to go and do something mm-hmm. uh, and, it, and our intention was to enjoy it, we'd either enjoy it or not. And so whatever, however we ended up would be the performance of that Endeavor. Okay. So then the question is, well, what is performance? I mean, yeah, that's performance. It's like the outcomes that human beings accomplish or don't in activity. What are the molecules? Let, let, let me just ask you for a second. So is there another, would some people think of that as the result? Yeah, you could think of it as the result of an activity. Okay. So the, the, the culmination of an activity and how it turned out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And... Now, there's other ways of looking at it, but that's the simplest way mm-hmm. in this moment, in this uh, set of ideas. So, what what does that? I mean, what, you know, how does performance turn out this way or that way is a function of the series of actions that people take or don't take. 
Mm-hmm. So you could say like the molecules of performance or the atoms of performance are actions. Mm-hmm. And we include by action my talking. So my talk is an action. Mm-hmm. Uh, we include uh, in, in action people's listening. So the people who are listening on the radio show, uh, if they're listening, well, they are listening. Right. And continue to listen, they'll either grasp certain things and it'll make a difference for them or they won't. Mm-hmm. The performance outcome out of this hour-long conversation will be what they see and what they can do with it. Mm-hmm. Or perhaps they didn't see anything and don't do anything with it, right? Right. So we see speaking and listening as action. And then there's obviously what I physically do. My moving this and that. Okay, then if performance is a series of actions and elevating performance is somehow having my actions be more effective, then the question is, how do, how do you do that? And is there some way to do that? I mean, right. Right? So the first law deals with the, with the relationship between, act, between action and what we say is the trim tab or, or fundamental nature of what you can deal with to cause new levels of action. Wait, say that again? Yeah. Okay. Let me start. Mm-hmm. Let me start a different way. If you ask people, why did you do what you did? Right. Just, well, why did you do that, right? People will come up with all sorts of answers. They'll say, I was sad about something and therefore I did this thing and that was my expression of it or I was motivated or, well, I wasn't thinking or I wanted this to happen or whatever mm-hmm. answer they Mostly people think of why they do what they do as a function of what causes they've got or psychological states they've got or what they know or they don't know. Or the situation, you know, the way, the way they perceive the situation. Yeah. That, that, to some I, degree. Yeah. Okay. To some, but, but how it's all seen as cause and effect. Right. Or psychologically based mm-hmm. or somehow knowledge based. In other words, oh, right. I, did, I did that because I never learned that or I did that because I learned mm-hmm. that. That's how we think. Right. The first law of performance says comes from a different place. It doesn't say there's anything wrong with all that. Right. It says there's another way of looking at life. And if you look at life this way, which we call the new paradigm of performance, you will have breakthroughs that you didn't have looking at it the other way. So it's just a matter of what works, not what's true for us. Right. I love that. Okay. Yeah. So the, the first law of performance is actions are correlated, and I will come back to that word, correlated, to the way in which people experience a situation, or more rigorously, the way in which a situation occurs to people. Okay, so there's three mm-hmm. notions. Action, correlation, and occurs. Right. So we're saying, remember, this is a different way of looking at it. And it's kind of like you have to suspend everything you know to sort of get it. We're saying that what I do and what I say or what I don't do and what I don't say is correlated to the way in which a situation occurs to me. Okay. So by correlated, for right now, let's just say in a dance with. If I could... People can imagine I'm going to hold up my hand. There's the front of my hand, and then there's the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. So in this sense of correlation, as an analogy, the front of my hand is correlated to the back of my hand. Right. The back of my hand is correlated to the front of my hand. It wouldn't make any sense to say the front of my hand causes the back of my hand. Okay. They come together. So... So just hold on one second. In, in, a, in a couple of minutes, I'm gonna, we're going to take a little bit of a break. But so with the correlation, so in the Buddhist perspective, you know, from a spiritual perspective, they call that co-arising. Hmm. So it co-arises. It arises together. Yes. Okay. It, yeah, that would be what I'm okay. and, and before, um, actually, we're going to take a break in just a moment. When, it, when we come back, I'm with Steve Zafron. Um, who's the author of The Three Laws of Performance, and we're talking about what these three laws are and how you actually get access to the possibility of breakthrough performance and breakthrough results. So um, we're going to just take a break for a moment, and then we'll be back. 
Okay, welcome back. This is Patricia Albert, and I'm with Steve Zafron, and we're talking about the three laws of performance, and he was beginning to speak about the, the first one. Um, so, carry on. <laughs> okay, what we were talking about is that the way in which someone does something, one's actions, is correlated. That is to say, it's an interesting relationship called correlation, or as you said, co-arising, mm -hmm. with the way in which situations occur to people. So now what does that mean? Right. Right now, you're in, I think, New Mexico? Yes, right? Santa Fe. Yeah, Santa Fe. And you're looking at a screen, you and I are looking at a screen in which we're both on the screen. Right. The way in which you're occurring for me is obviously very different than the way in which I'm occurring for you. We're looking at two different pictures. Mm -hmm. And then people throughout the world are listening to this on the radio or on the internet, and mm -hmm. they are having a way this conversation is occurring for them. Right. Or I walk down the street and someone's walking towards me and it's a dark night and I'm not sure of the neighborhood, that moment has an occurring for me called watch out. Right. If the sun were out and I could look around more clearly, it would be fine. Right. Uh, or if it was your neighborhood. You know, I mean, it was like you're like the, the guy in the neighborhood, then it would feel really different. It wouldn't matter that it was dark. Right. Okay. So if, if people can remember times when they've had long conversations with other people, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're meeting, you're leading a meeting and you're getting clear about what the team's going to do or the family's together and you're going through, okay, from now on, here's how we're going to manage this and everything seems clear and then a month later, the things that people said they would do didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You reconvene everybody and it's like, no, I never said that. And then you wonder, what happened in that meeting? Right. Are people crazy? Are they just problem? Are they unconscious? Mm -hmm. Well, it could be, but it may be that everybody was in a different meeting. They're having their own meeting mm -hmm. in which that meeting occurred for them and what they needed to do in the future was all different for people. We never take the time to make sure that we're all looking at the same picture. Right. Absolutely. And, right. And so when we look at the same picture, then we're all looking at the same way the future or whatever we're dealing with is occurring for us. Mm -hmm. Actions will be correlated to that. Okay, that's the first law of performance. Okay. Uh, second law of performance is the most abstract, most difficult. It deals with where does this thing called occurring exist? And we say that it exists in language. For human beings, the way in which a situation, and that includes you, the people in the situation, myself in the situation, all occurs for oneself, lives in language. So let me just try this, you know, out so that maybe people can um, understand even more fully. So the way I occur for myself, so let's say I'm in a situation with, um, you know, I'm in a meeting with other teachers, you know, other people that are, that are teachers and we're discussing something global that we want to do. If I occur for myself as I'm just lucky I'm here right. instead of that I'm a leader, I'm some kind of force of change and I am committed to some kind of global impact, period, then my actions and behavior would be a very different, I would show up very differently depending on if I felt like I'm, I'm just lucky to be here, I hope they don't kick me out, as opposed to truly being a leader. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. All right. And if you got it from a... So we've worked in lots of companies, as you mentioned at the show. Yeah. I'm a consulting company that uses these ideas in organizations. Right. And we've worked, as you said, all over the world. Yeah. I'm thinking of one place we worked in Peru, in the Andes of Peru, in a copper mine. Wow. And the way in which the world occurred for the different people in that mine was very, very different. So there's a caste system in Peru. Uh, like if you're descended from the... Spanish, you're at the top of that system. Mm -hmm. Goes down in all the variations to pure Incan Indian descendants, right? Right. And to the degree where, if you're you, in this organization, if you were at the bottom of that caste system, when you were talking to someone above you, you would literally not look in their eyes because that would be insulting. Right. So, how your superiors occurred to you was very different than how it would be here in the United yeah. States. Now, that's not, when you understand that, it is not surprising that they had the worst safety record in Peru. Interesting. Not surprising that they kept 
blowing up things or $200 million trucks would fall down the mountain. Right. When they actually shifted the way in which they all occurred for each other, right. they had breakthroughs in performance. Okay, so, so let me just say it again. So, so seeing automatically, so we have cultural conversations mm -hmm. that we're yep. not even aware of, that we're not allowed to think certain ways or take action in certain ways. You know, a long time ago, women couldn't, weren't allowed to vote. We were, you know, there were certain openings that were not there for us. Right. So exactly. then, of course, unless that would change, you can't take action differently because you're a second-class citizen. Yeah, or, well, unless you bought, if you buy into seeing the world in that way. In that way, got it, okay. And you will do the kinds of things people who see the world in that way do. Right. Now, well, that's why, it's, it's interesting, I got, I got recently obsessed with watching 24, you know, the TV series with Jack Bauer, you know, it's right. completely obsessed, I watched the whole thing. And Jack Bauer is like your, your great example of performance, because the way the world occurs to him, he always has access to powerful breakthrough, get it done, no matter what, and serve the highest good. There's always some solution. Yeah. He always, like, finds a solution. I think that's what everybody loved about him because he, he didn't see the world the same way everybody else was. Yeah. And, but, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which made him effective. Yeah. And that's, a, and that's a TV show that's very real for certain people. Right. Right. And, you know, like the SEALs, the SEALs training. Yeah. But they are trained that there's always a solution. Absolutely. Going to get it done, right? Yeah. So, but that's a way to see the world. Yes. Anyway, our, my point in the second yeah. one was that the way the, world, the way anything occurs mm -hmm. is in language in some way. You created a view of yourself when you were young by talking to yourself and creating how, how you do things. Right. You bought into your culture's idea of how you do things, mm -hmm. that language. You um, came up with theories about how to do things, mm -hmm. which these now tell you how to do things. So it's all linguistic, basically. And the third law of performance then says, future-based language, whatever that is, transforms the way in which situations occur to people. So, so say that again. Just say it one more time. So future... Yeah. Future-based language, and okay. I'll explain in a moment. Okay, Got whatever future-based language is, transforms the way situations occur to people. So if I transform the way the situation occurs to someone, then their actions will naturally shift because their actions are correlated to the way in which situations occur to people. Right. So we say transform, and we don't say change because we mean transform, not change. So change could be a big change. Something is much more improved. Something's much better. Something is, there's less of that. I change my lifestyle. I learn to live on less money or... I change my relationship, mm -hmm. my where I live. All those are are great, fine. I think you know that's how people change things, but that's not transformation. Mm -hmm. Transformation is like when the Berlin Wall came down; it transformed the relationships between Russia and the United States. Right. It was not predictable, but it did happen. Right. When John F. Kennedy said, we'll have a man on the moon in 10 years as a declaration, something improbable and unpredictable got set into motion, and it happened. That was a transformation. Absolutely. When Mandela began his quest with a number of other people in South Africa to have a South Africa that was integrated, that was an unpredictable transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, when certain people, great leaders, have gone through what they've called a crucible experience, when they've confronted that everything they were doing wasn't going to work out, mm -hmm. not really, not what they, it wasn't what they really right. wanted, and they shifted the way they were working in life completely, that was a transformation for them. Yeah. So it does exist, transformation, it's a real phenomenon. Most people have no idea how to make it happen, mm -hmm. saying the way you make transformations happen is by creating new language, future-based language, which language comes from the future and creates the future. So that sounds all kind of strange, but it's very simple. Think of a promise. 
I promise to do something with you, mm -hmm. I'm creating a future. That's not a description of what I'm going to do. It's creating the future of what I'm going to do. Right. And if right. I operate with integrity with regard to what I promise, that promise tends to turn out. Mm -hmm. The future has a different result in it by virtue of my promise that it would have had if I didn't make the promise. Right. If I make a commitment and I live that commitment, that commitment is a future-based statement which shapes and organizes the future to happen. From our own country, the Declaration of Independence right. was future-based language that 52 people wrote, signed their name to, and created a whole new possibility in this part of the world. Now, none of it came easy, so this is not like, uh, oh, this is so easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, after they wrote the Declaration of Independence, they had to fight a war. Right. They may have lost the war, in which case the Declaration of Independence would not have turned into this country. So they had to fight a war and win the war, and then they could create the next evolution mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, when I take on something new in my life that I've never done before because I have now confronted the way my life is going is not where I want it to go, and I want to shift direction, mm -hmm. that is an easy thing to do. Right. It makes a difference. And it's, I think, worth doing. It's just not easy. What well, seems one element of that, that future-based you know, commitment or a declaration, you then need to surrender to what you've committed to so that that shapes the way that you are, you know, so that you are remade by the declaration that you've, you've made. Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. You have to surrender to it. So when it's there and clear for you, you don't need to surrender it to it. But when it's not, you need to surrender to it. Right. You know, that's it, what you give in. That. Yeah. Yeah. You commit it to. Right. So I've seen that kind of ideas implemented in organizations and large, small, very, you know, family-owned businesses, major corporations. And I've seen it do amazing things when people, like you said, surrender to it, or we would say, operated with integrity with regard to it, mm -hmm. became the game to play, whether they felt like it that day or not. Right. Yes. You know, great, great athletes go to their game. It doesn't matter how they feel. They go to the game mm -hmm. to win, right? Well, can you speak? Absolutely. I mean, all, um, complete commitment, you become it completely. Yes. So there's no separation between you and it anymore if you're completely committed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you become it. Um, yeah. So speak a little bit about, I, one of the things that I think is really um, illuminate, illuminative, I don't know if that's the right word, but um, has to do with what's the, what's the difference between a default future mm -hmm. and a created future? Right. So in the book, uh, we talk about this thing called the default future. Every moment of now, you and I have some sense of the future. Mm -hmm. We may not be thinking about it, but it's there always. It's always there. I mean, we are assuming that things, for example, where, you, where you're living in New Mexico, there's not going to be all of a sudden this major storm that comes in. Right, rarely. <laughs> right? right. But that's where it's at for you right now. Yeah. And I'm here in Miami, and I'm assuming I'm sitting in a building, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of things about the next moment of time, right. which is the building's not going to fall apart and all this stuff, right? So there's a lot of expectations we have about the future always. Mm -hmm. We have fears we have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So most of the future lives kind of like that, unconsciously and unawarely. So all that's part of the default future. It's not examined. Let, let me ask you a question, too. It's Partly not examined, but is there also, do you sense, I'm not, I'm not, I'm asking a real question, is, is there a momentum to the default future? Well, yes. Spiritually, I, they would say there's a karmic momentum. You know, there's like a, a movement in a certain direction that if you don't stop it, it's going there. Well, I'd say it's, it's more than a movement, it's total. So, it's okay. Some, okay. See, some of it, let me step back to a totally other place, if that's okay with you. Sure, yeah. A lot of what we've been doing in our research of what these methodologies and ideas is 
checking it out against important disciplines to make sure it's consistent with other disciplines, mm -hmm. which is brain science. Yes. So it is that we study brain science to figure this out. We work with people and get a sense of what works here and then create the methodologies and then check it against other disciplines to make sure it's consistent. So at the nature, at the level of you and I as creatures of our brain, and we are creatures of our brain, mm -hmm. our brain is always concerned, you could say, about one thing and one thing only. What's going to happen next? Yes, we are, survival. We are, yeah, we are wired for what's about to happen next. Right. So when things are not threatening, when things are threatening, our amygdala kicks in and we're doing whatever it tells us to do. Mm hmm and that's how come we survive. Right. When we're not threatened, and so there's time to examine and so forth, the brain is sort of looking at the moment and, you know, what's going to happen next with this and making predictions and mm -hmm. that. But the brain, that's all our brain cares about, what's going to happen next. So it is total. And the predictions that the brain, or the projections the brain makes about the future is all based on the past. That's how the past gets to influence the future. Right. Influences the future, and it's because it influences the future that it's important. Correct. Well, so, and also the, the aren't the grooves in the brain. You know, the more you do something, the more it has like a, a way that. You, yeah, it gets deeper and deeper. It's etched deeper. Right. Deeper. So when you're trying to create new territory, you're actually creating new grooves in your brain. Well, you, you, you're fighting the grooves that are there and intending to and create new. Yeah, we call that rewiring the brain, yeah. and we brain scientists are, do not think it's much, mostly possible. We do. We say that the way you rewire your brain is through language, basically. I completely agree. That's a radical thought. Yeah. Anyway, the default future is the predictable, probable future. Mm -hmm. Assume we have our own version of it. We're doing what we're doing now based on a lot of projections about what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. and that that's not that that's questioned all chaos breaks loose because all of a sudden we know the future that's about to happen is not what our what we've been assuming right now we're scrambling to see what is the future that's going to happen so that's kind of the default future in play that's why I said it's kind of total mm -hmm. and to the degree where I've read you know when the tsunami hit um Thailand and that area some years ago, mm -hmm. an island called Phuket that I happened to have visited some years before. So I know, I know the beach where the tsunami came in, wow. wiped out, you know, massive destruction and people and so forth. What I've read by survivors, well, there were people who were on the beach that didn't see the tsunami. They even pointed it out to them. They said, run, 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 look, look at that. And people couldn't see it. It didn't fit the patterns of perception that were in their brain. It was just such an unlikely occurrence, they couldn't even see it. Wow. That is more common than you think, okay? Yeah. So, what's my point here? My point is, if you understand that, that in terms of our relationship, if I'm married to someone, I have a default future for the relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm in mostly. Assumptions. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a company and I'm head of the strategy for the company, I got to confront the default future that the company's got. That's sort of inherited. It's mm -hmm. going in this. Everyone says things are fine. We'll go in this direction, or well, things are not fine. We shouldn't go in this direction, or whatever people say. In the face of all that, if I confront that the default future, once examined, is not the future I want, then I'm, you know, I need to intervene. And the intervention is what we call applying future-based language to the future that we're living into. Let me say one other thing about the default. Um, um, and I've, I heard Dave talk about it a little bit, Your Dave Logan, your writing partner, is most people, if you stop them, they can actually, like in any of those areas you were speaking of, like in their relationship or in the place that they're working or the direction that they're going with their health or whatever, they actually know where it's going. Yes. It's not a mystery. I mean, if you really, they really do know on some level where it's going if they look. 
And I think yeah. that could be useful for people to, to think about that. It's very important, yeah. It's not like while it's below our level of awareness and mostly unconscious. Right. It doesn't mean we can't bring it into the level of awareness. Right. And you don't need a psychic. I mean, you know, you actually, if you stop mm -hmm. and you're not completely in denial, you could find it. Yeah, you can, you can get a, you can take the flashlight of your consciousness and aim it into the yeah. unexamined and dark places in right. your life. Yeah. Okay. And it, it takes some courage. Yeah. I think what you're saying is very, very important, and it takes the courage of, of looking at what's really going on here. Where are we really going? Mm -hmm. You want to go there. Yeah. And where am I going, and who am I in the right. matter? Yeah. Okay. So then if you, you decide, because this, this is an exciting conversation, it's like, well, then I don't want to go exactly where I would go just without thinking about it, you know, my particular way of, you know, showing up in life. I I want to I want to create a future. Mm. So then, how do I do that in language? Well, there's some conditions. Remember, yeah. nothing nothing's really there's no free lunch. I know. Okay. So, what are the conditions of, under which people can create futures that are powerful that have the that can replace the default future? Yeah. Okay. One condition is the thing we've been pointing at is called integrity. I have to be willing. It's like I give you my word. You and I are going to create something together. Mm -hmm. And I say to you, all right, we haven't created it together, Patricia, but whatever we do create, if we create something, and I'm obviously here, so I have to agree to it. Right. I will give you, I give you my word now that I will honor whatever we create. Yeah. So I've created a condition of integrity, right? And then there may be some things I have to address with you that I that I question, or you need to ask with me that you question mm -hmm. things that have happened in the past. That's particularly important in organizations, complex organizations, because the groups in the organizations will have things that are incomplete between them. Right. You know, we've worked in uh, union management situations where our very one client we had had 11 unions, and they were all fighting with each other, and they were all fighting with management, and this has gone on for years. Oh, my God. So they had a history of nobody keeping their word. Right. And, but as they confronted, all right, regardless, we are going to a very nasty place. We are going to go out of business. Mm -hmm. At the urgency of going out of business, mm -hmm. they confronted, look, let's talk about what we did in the past in a truthful way so we can get it out of the way. Mm -hmm. So they, they dealt with the stuff that they had done that they had never acknowledged and how they had tried it and they gave that up for the future. They said, okay, we're not going to play those games anymore. Here, I want to make a point too because some of the people listening have done a lot of spiritual work or psychological work and what I love about the, the, the transformational perspective, you know, from, from a performance, a level of performance and commitment is you can explore and be honest about like what's incomplete with you and another person and forgive them and the rest of it, but nothing new occurs yeah. because there's no commitment to something in the future that's going to be any different. Right. We would call that creating something bigger than yourself. Yes. So I think that's a really important thing to underline and highlight is you need to be about something bigger than just the connection or the relationship or being complete or feeling good. Um, it, you need to have something at stake, right? You need to have something that you're, you're going to be, your life's going to be about. Yes, it's very well said. Absolutely. Uh, individually, personally, relationships and organization-wide. Mm -hmm. At some level, it would be nice if countries could do that. Yeah. Right? Um, and may be forced to do that. So what motivates people to do this difficult work we're talking about? Well, one is the urgency of the danger of the situation. Mm -hmm. That's called, like, hurting platforms. Right. That's not always there. I mean, it's not always like, you know, good companies that are doing well don't have burning platforms, usually. On the other hand, the opportunity to be great, mm -hmm. to be great, requires this kind of work. So it's, are you really up to something, like you said? Yeah. You really want to be great. 
do I want my life to be an expression of everything possible that I can bring to it? Do I want our company to be an expression of everything that we can bring to this game, right? Do I want my team to be up for the championship? We may not win it, but we're up for it. We're playing for it. Well, there's, there's a level, too, that I want to I wanna, um, put words to is there are people, too, where it's not necessarily that they're a part of an organization, but they're innovators. They're innovators of beingness, of evolution. And um, one of the things that I've talked about is that there's um, an evolutionary impulse. You know, it's like whatever it was that came from the Big Bang that eros that's, that's creating the world and all the dynamism and the manifestation, that when you align with that mm. and what it wants mm. and you commit to what it wants, which is always way bigger than what you're, you know, the ego is always trying to be comfortable and small and, you know, know what's going on and, you know, have some sense of certainty or, you know, all the things that you, you know, we fight against. But that your methodology is also like in that level of commitment to something that wants to make the world more beautiful, true, and good. Yes. yes. That to be committed to something greater in that way. And, you know, you can come up with a particular project or something, but then it keeps unfolding from there, right? Well, I think it's important, the way I would look at it, um, is having core values. Mm -hmm which core values rule whatever you create. Right. right. So I think in your sense, you're talking about a core value of the evolution and fulfillment of the direction that you sense we're moving in. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be my core value is to be on the edge. Just like when we met Werner, you know, so long ago, that work was right on the leading edge. Like when you'd say transformation, people were clueless. I mean, they thought butterflies. I mean, you could, you had to explain so much more than what you just had to explain. <laughs> so there was a, there was an emerging edge of something that then has moved the world yes. in a certain direction. And that emerging edge continues to move and it's, it has new forms at this point. Yeah. Right. Well, we're, so. we're as, as we talked about, we are creatures of survival and we're groups of survival yeah. and groups groups of survival. We're social beings, basically. Yeah. We have an illusion of being individuals, but everyone's individuality exists in a context of relationship and organization and group. Totally. But that, you know, we're, that's how we are, wired. And what, for me, it's like, what would have the highest value of self-expression in groups and nationalities and peoples here on this planet? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. the that's the pattern to find. That's the that's the future. The future to create. Yeah. You know. Do you find um, we don't have a lot of time left, but I, I want to ask you this because I've noticed that things seem like they're speeding up and going faster. Mm. Everything, you know, it seems like you know there's more. Uh, we have more access to speed in in all of it. Do you find that when you're working with large organizations, still is it is it easier to move the reality? No, it's the I, don't, same. I don't find it easier. I don't know that I find it more difficult. It's the things you have to deal with are different. So, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you have to deal with is this chaotic complexity of very short term mentality. Yes. So, everything is short term. It's fast, but it's short term. Got it. So, you know, one of the great things about this conversation mm -hmm. you and I had. Yes. It hasn't had to be sound bites. You didn't say, see, we've got 10 minutes, whatever you're going to say, Save make it real. Fast, yeah. <laughs> but I've done a lot of interviews where that was the request. I mean, that's listening to the show, wanted to hear something really just really short. Right. Quick. And, you know, texts have taken over. The kids text. They don't even email. Email is too long. Way too through. long. <laughs> right. So I was working with a very mm -hmm. young people young in age, uh, people in high-tech area with a very large company building a platform for their, their company, right? So these were super bright men, young men in their 20s, mm -hmm. uh, who got these ideas, and they were, for them, new and cool. 
I mean, the idea of spending time to actually write out something and just kind of <laughs> on that. The idea of looking at examining what they hadn't examined before was kind of new and cool for them. Wow. Nobody taught them that, right? So I think ideas that you and I maybe started to learn 30-something years ago are still new and cool. Yeah. They may need to be packaged a little bit differently. I don't know, but um, they're still exciting ideas for yeah, people. Yeah, totally. Well, I also think there's a, a big piece that's still that's that needs more development, especially culturally. I think you know people go with the flow, and you know there's this thing of like if you just stay in the present moment, you know it's all going to unfold and turn out. And I've never felt that. You know, I mean, I've never felt that that was the, the case. I mean, I, I feel like the momentum of people's already way of being, you know, is what actually unfolds moment to moment, even mm. if you know how to, you know, taste the strawberry and be totally here. So, you know, this work of standing for something and committing to something and surrendering to a future that's bigger than just your own personal experience of pleasure or safety um, is, will never go out of style. Um, and I don't think it'll ever be easy. I mean, it always pushes up against the, the, our, our hardwiring uh, yes. that's not very evolved. Yes, exactly. Brilliant. So, you know, um, let me see if there, so how, what else do you want to say before we complete? You know, how do people get in touch with you? Um, you know, definitely I want to highly, highly recommend uh, reading The Three Laws of Performance. They should go online right now and get that and read it because it's extremely inspiring and you give uh, vivid examples of how you've made a difference. I appreciate that. Dave and I spent, uh, my co-author Dave Logan is a professor at Marshall School of Business. Yeah. Uh, for various reasons, we got committed to, we were part of a think tank, we got committed to writing a book that would communicate these complex ideas, but simply, yeah. and not have to have people have a big background to the ideas and so forth. So that was the intention. The book came out in 2009. It was a bestseller in the United States. Yeah. Now in its third printing in the United States, and it's in been translated into 16 languages. Fantastic. So people can get it here in the U.S. is on Amazon. Well, yeah. Amazon, actually. Um, also, if you can find out consulting yeah. website, which is Vanto Group, V as in Victor, Vanto, V-A-N-T-O Group. Great. Dot com. Dot com. Yeah. Great. And, yeah, anyone who has a, a company, you know, a large enough company to, to be able to bring you in, um, it's a it's a guarantee of something that's unprecedented. I mean, you you guys are committed to unprecedented results, and uh, and you deliver. I mean, you you fulfill on your promises. So, um, is there anything anything else anything else? And then um, I'll just tell people a little bit about the next show and stuff. Uh, well, I think your stand. The thing you said I think is critical, just to leave people with that. There is the moment-to-moment -moment living of life, mm -hmm. which is enhanced by a future I'm standing for. So it's right. not in replace of it, it's yeah. enhanced. And if people are willing to stand for something bigger than themselves, we will have an awesome future as people and as, as a species. Yes. So yes. Thanks for your commitment. Yeah, thank you. Definitely. And I, I also feel that the larger, like when you get access to what it wants to, you know, there's some kind of evolutionary process that when you're, you're in you're you're in a, you're in a dance with that, mm. and you allow your life to be about that. Mm. Then there's even more power than than if you just want to be uh, successful. Right. You know, there's something even greater that that the wind comes to your back, and mm. is uh, definitely for the people that are willing to to make those commitments and and live from that place and be undone, right. and redone. Right. <laughs> definitely. Uh, Thank you. The opportunity. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for living this. And, you know, when you say giving your word, I just get... <laughs> it, it has such weight. You know, the level of integrity and the, the you know, the Jack Bauer that you are there. <laughs> I deeply respect and, and recognize. So... Uh, so uh, one thing I uh, wanted to let people know about next week is Jeff Carrera, who is my teaching partner, who I also have that uh, commitment 
you know, we have a level of commitment to transforming uh, collectives, actually, collectives and, and, and relationships from an evolutionary standpoint. And he's magnificent. He'll be on the show next week, and we're going to be talking about what the portal is to higher, higher states of consciousness. So, and it, and it has very much to do with instead of, you know, people counting on their moods or what emotional state they happen to be in, there's actually a portal that has to do with a certain stand, a certain way of being that allows you to move into higher states of consciousness. And without that, you, you really don't. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. And then one other thing is in, in June, um, I'm going to be in Los Angeles live and going to be doing on June 16th and 17th uh, the Evolutionary Relationships course. Uh, so I really want to let anyone who knows who's in the California area um, that I'd love to have you come to that. And if you just go to the, the website, evolutionarycollective.com, you can find out more about that. So is there anything else? I think we have one more minute. Well, anything? I think the only thing left is to say that whatever you thought was not possible is possible. Here, I have a question. What's yeah. the, the future you're committed to right now? What's your uh, age? I'm committed to there be these, the ideas you and I have worked with for 34 years yeah. have, have an explosive impact and spread virally through the world. Yes. I totally, I, I am committed to that commitment. Absolutely. So thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'll see you next week with Jeff Carrera.